Coming up on Tech Thing, how much RAM do you really need? Protect yourself from rogue USB thumb drives and the terrors of rubber duckies. Three things we're excited to see at DEF CON. All that and more coming up next on Tech Thing. If you get something useful out of this episode of Tech Thing, please consider contributing to the show at patreon.com slash tech thing. We're brought to you by viewers just like you. Thank you so much. I'm Shannon Morse. And I'm Patty Norton. And this is Tech Thing, where we have something useful in every single show. Oh my goodness. In honor of DEF CON, which we will be attending this week, mm -hmm. the, the little punk rock brother of uh, Black Hat, which <laughs> are basically... Places where security professionals and IT professionals and forensic professionals and cops and everybody else gather and hackers to sit and talk and exchange information on the latest threats or to reveal new and exciting threats. I just want to say, make sure your operating system updates are turned on to auto. Make yes. sure you have like antivirus and anti-malware installed and, and just don't click on weird things. <laughs> and if you get an advertisement, you know, just tell everyone you know you do tech support for. If you get an advertisement that says, you know, you have a Windows infection, call 1-800 and install this application now. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's not how they do business. <laughs> no. Microsoft is never going to put a pop-up on your computer in the middle of Chrome that says, your system has been violated. Please install this. Or, uh, yeah. All right. So I guess we should start it off with a tweet. And this yes. one comes from at Gene Comer. He says, at TechThing, at Snubs, and at Patrick Norton. Any suggestions on methods to check thumb drives which came from uncertain sources like a trade show? Oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. uh, it depends on how paranoid you are. It depends on the trade show. Um, CES, yeah. SEMA, NAB, the National Association of Sewage Handlers, whatever. I don't worry about it that much. <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm being kind of random there, but <laughs> I, I, I remember like I remember being at a trade show, and one yeah. side of it was trade show A, and the other side was trade show B, oh, I which know what was you're the giant about. sort of machines that suck uh, uh, sewage out of. Oh, never mind. I don't know what you were talking uh, about. It was it was like a trade show for people that sell just service porta potties. <laughs> It was two very yeah. different groups. So basically, you, you go to these trade shows, like every single booth will give right. you free flash drives with all of their press releases on them or you know pictures, video files, what, what have you, product information. Right. Generally, those are fine, and I don't worry about them too much. I have checked on occasion to make sure that they're legit, but that's because I'm paranoid. Right. You're a security professional. On the other hand, if you're going to DEF CON or Schmoo CON, yeah. or you know, the sidewalk outside of a bank yeah. during those times, pretty much just kill it with fire because yeah. you know you don't want to trust those. You want to be paranoid when you're in that kind of environment. Yeah, I mean, or or if you work at say a, you know, an agency where you need a security clearance or something yes. like if there's a thumb drive outside, assume it's trying to kill you and eat your face. <laughs> Um, you know, you might be worried about viruses or trojans on that thumb drive, which are bad, but tools like Hack5's Rubber Ducky um, take advantage of, well, actually Windows and OS X and Linux and everything else. Um, they just, you know, recognize, oh, it's a USB HID thing that says it's a keyboard. It says it's a keyboard. Welcome USB thing. Yeah. And then what happens? So <laughs> the, the Rubber Ducky, it acts like a head. It's a human interface device, a yeah. keyboard. It types batch scripts, which are plugged into here on a micro SD card, into the computer really, really fast. Like a thousand like, words per minute. Yeah, super fast. So it'll open windows, it'll dump keystrokes, pretty much so fast that you won't even notice. And then, hey, you're root kitted or you get a reverse shell or somebody has gotten into your machine that shouldn't right. necessarily be in there. If somebody's really perverse, they could use it to make sure your AV software is on and updated or, or automate the installation of software and setting configs for every new machine being set up by the IT department. It's Which is a awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really cool, but how do you tell that's a rubber ducky or a thumb drive? Yeah, it just looks like a regular flash drive, so it's really hard to tell. I'm going to bite this to open it. <laughs> my, my, my dentistry. Because that's how I roll. I know, isn't that horrible? But I do it anyway. <laughs> yeah, I fix it. People are like, drive. what are you doing? So <laughs> if you're unsure, you can break into it, and then you know for sure that it is not a USB flash drive because there's a little micro SD card at the very top of it. And generally speaking, your USB thumb drive does not have they any don't micro, have micro SD, card. SD cards in them. Uh, uh, if yours has one in there, it's a USB rubber ducky. Other than that, um, yeah, there's a few software things you can mm -hmm. do. Um, if you're on a Linux machine, you can run 
LSUSB, which is a command line uh, tool to find out what the USB shows up as mm -hmm. in your computer. If it shows up as a keyboard, it's a USB rubber ducky. If it shows up as a USB flash drive, it's a USB flash drive. <laughs> uh, same thing with device manager in Windows. Right. You can check it through there. If it shows up as a keyboard, it's a USB flash or USB rubber ducky. <laughs> and then you can hold down control or the Windows key when you're plugging in a flash drive. And if it starts doing weird things on your computer, when you hold down those right. keys, you know it's a USB rubber ducky because either it's going to like hit control Z, control M or whatever it might be, or Windows key R, you'll notice things starting to run on your computer, but you'll be screwing up the script since you'll be holding down extra keys, if that makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> so being worried about USB thumb drives is a good idea, um, but you're probably good to go open it up in a VM on your laptop yes. or wait till you get home and put it on a burner machine where you don't air care. Air-gapped machine. You get air-gapped burner machine. Like, like the machine you don't care about. The machine you set up and be like, I'm going to do foul, terrible things to this <laughs> and it's not connected to my network so I don't <laughs> care. Um, you know, and you, it's, it's, if you are seriously paranoid, and that's, that seems pretty reasonable, um, don't put a strange USB drive into a machine uh, that you need to use, especially if you're traveling. Mm -hmm. um, yes. You know, because like, okay, I like the idea though, it's just like hitting control and then inserting it, but I still like, if you're really yeah. paranoid, set up a virtual machine when you're traveling. Uh, it's also a really good idea if you're dealing with drives or flash drives that belong to your friend or family member that's constantly downloading weird stuff, you know, cracked applications or clicking on those fake Windows ads that irritate me so much. Uh, the ones that always tell you to call for tech support and then tell you to install a remote admin software. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Yeah. yeah. I just, just be careful. Yeah. 99.99% of the time, you have nothing to fear from a USB thumb drive at a trade show. It is very smart to put on that tinfoil hat, though. And of course, if you guys have questions or concerns, you can always email us. I'm really into security and privacy. So you can email us, ask at techthing.com, and hopefully we'll have an answer for you. Got a question? Curious to see us review a product on Tech Thing? Got a tip or an idea you want to share with the crew? Please fire them out to ask at techthing.com or you can tweet at techthing, at snubs, or at Patrick Norton. And hey, if you want to be part of the crew that makes this show possible, please contribute to the show at patreon.com slash techthing. Just a dollar will make a difference and you'll get access to our patron-only build videos and more. Seriously, thank you for your patronage. You make the show possible. And if you can't donate, we understand. Keep sending in those emails. And if you can spare a moment or two to give our video or our YouTube or our Facebook page a thumbs up or a like, we would really appreciate it. Thank you so much. It all helps. Three questions answered, three reviews, three picks, all in three minutes. This week's Rapid Fire Roundup is three things we're excited to see at DEF CON. Shannon. Ready. Are you? Yes, I totally. think so. Totally. Absolutely. Absolutely. Go! <laughs> I'm actually excited to see way more than just three things, including all my friends out there in Vegas. I can't wait to see everybody. So I have three different talks that I'm really interested in. Uh, just to top it off, first off, I have picking Bluetooth low energy locks from a quarter mile away. That oh, sounds goodness. really scary. Um, there's actually the talk synopsis over at defcon.org, so you can read it yourself. But basically, this talk interests me because Bluetooth is so commonly used and so many Bluetooth low energy products are currently being used for mm -hmm. deadbolts, for locks, and for things of that nature. So I'm really interested in the security. It turns out that they are hackable from 400 meters away. Called this two years ago. <laughs> it's scary. They're also releasing a war walking yeah. tool. So this is kind of like war driving where you would drive around and find open wireless networks. So I'm assuming a war walking tool would be like walking around and finding Bluetooth low energy tools that are unlockable, uh, which I would like to get my hands on to test because I would love to get one of those things in for review. That would be really cool. Well, yeah. Also, if you get the products in to review to test the hacking tool on, you're much, le much less likely to find yourself afoul of the law. Yeah. Should anybody notice? Very true. Because to figure out if that front door lock was unlocked, you kind of have to open the door. You that's, do. <laughs> that's, that's crossing the line into illegal oh. behavior. And number two for the talks I'm interested in seeing is the Mr. Robot panel. So this one sounds really cool because they are bringing in not the actors, who probably would have no clue how a hack works, but they're bringing in the technical advisors who are in charge of making sure that the hacks on Mr. Robot are legit. So this is probably the only time a Hollywood show has actually taken hacks seriously and actually portrayed them as realistic. So I would like to hear more about like what kind of feedback they have gotten from a wider audience, not just the hackers who watch the right. show, just like you know the me people, the friends that I have. 
we all enjoyed the show, but I'm really curious to hear what a much larger audience thinks of the show for consumers. It's I'm just curious also what it's like having dealt with producers, you know, it's yeah. actually Windows DOS, I'm curious not about that DOS. too. <laughs> well, it has periods, it's Windows DOS. Well, <laughs> have fun. By the way, it's not so Windows DOS or Windows DOS, it's DOS. Interesting. Oh my goodness. And number three is actually a B-Sides LV, which is a smaller hacker con that's going on during the same week. Uh, this one is called Ingress Egress, which if you don't know, Pokemon Go was made by the same people that made Ingress, uh, which I was obsessed with for like a year. The Emerging Threats Posed by Augmented Reality Gaming. Uh, so this is directed at players of Pokemon Go. The game is exploitable. I want to learn what information can be intercepted about the players because apparently you can track movements of players and a right. bunch of other stuff. So I also want to learn if there is a way to not only play the game, but also be smart about it. Because I'm currently a player of Pokemon Go. I know that it probably does have a lot of issues uh, with security and privacy. So I want to learn if there is a way that I can, I don't know, maybe VPN it, but then your directions would change, your GPS would probably be off. So I don't know. By the way, I'm curious. probably not a good week to play Pokemon Go in Las Vegas. Which stinks, because they have different <laughs> Pokemon out there. Oh, man. So the other thing I want to check out, and yeah, I know this is a f number four, the Pony Express team, they created a, a device called Blue Hydra, which is supposed to be able to probe for Bluetooth devices nearby and then log information about those devices. Uh, there's also this talk called Attacking Network Infrastructure to Generate a 4 terabyte DDoS for $5, which sounds crazy to me. It's insanely funny as well that so this can happen. So five bucks for a distributed denial of service attack, probably for, so basically. They're doing it through a $5 VPN. If script kitty activities are too difficult for you, what? Just welcome to five bucks That's to awesome. whack somebody in the head. <laughs> I was like geeking out or about it. <laughs> I'm also going to see a lot of new car and a lot of new avionics hacks. Those are always really big at mm -hmm. DEF CON. And I'm also seeing a lot of talks featuring LTE hacks, which is scary because LTE is the highest of the highest cell phone data service that you can currently get. LTE is not supposed to be hackable, right. but it is. And they're going to be featuring some of the things that they can currently do, as well as building their own tower station. So, ah! <laughs> scariest words you can hear it's is be a awesome. large organization or corporation going, "Well, our internal team has determined that this is unhackable and completely <laughs> secure." Oh man, mm. it's crazy! So, if you guys are going to DefCon in Las Vegas this weekend, make sure to stop by the Hack Five vendor booth and say hello. It's oh, crazy man. there. Both of us are going to be there though. With little aprons for the on. hack shop <laughs> with our aprons. And also, we're hosting a meetup on Friday of this week at 9 p.m. in Las Vegas. Uh, details are over at hack5.org. Mm -hmm. We are not making reservations, so just show up. and We're just going to take over the bar. Yeah. So, <laughs> yay! <laughs> It'll be fun. I want to know what your picks are if you are going to DEF CON mm -hmm. or if you're interested in any talks there. Maybe I'll be able to interview them for one of our shows on Hack 5, and I would love to. So let me know what you're interested in over at askattechthing.com, or you can tweet me at snubs. We got a tweet, actually at Patrick Norton got a tweet <laughs> from at Garf Nodi who says, would running Android apps be a good reason to get a Chromebook with four gigabytes of RAM instead of two gigs? What would you say, sir? Oh man, I, I, I always say get more memory. Yeah, <laughs> me too. Um, especially when you're talking about like one or two gigabytes, uh, I would get four. I mean, seriously though, a Chromebook running Chrome or Android apps, not that there are really that many Chrome devices running Android apps yet. Um, they can run okay with two gigabytes of RAM. I would say just go for more RAM whenever possible, especially on a device like a Chromebook or a laptop where you probably can't update the RAM. Um, how much RAM do you think OS X El Capitan has as a minimum? Um, eight gigs? Four? Yeah. So it turns out OS X El Capitan has a minimum requirement of two gigabytes of RAM. Windows what? 10 only requires one gigabyte if you're updating a 32-bit device. Two gigabytes for everything else. Oh. Um, that said, seriously, I, I don't want to run. Yeah, seriously, for oh. the minimum. Well, it's okay. You know, I don't run OS 10 or Windows with less than eight gigabytes of RAM if I can. Mm -mm. Though I know a bunch of folks that say revived old XP netbooks with one gigabyte of RAM by moving them to Windows 8 or Windows 10. Uh, because, you know, 8 and 10 have much better memory handling than Windows 7. Uh, it's still not a lot of RAM. No, it's not a lot of RAM. I guess it's fine if, like, all you're doing is getting on the internet. Yes. If you're, like, and, and if you have, like, a 1 gigabyte, 2 gigabyte device, you probably are <laughs> running a single application at yeah. a time. Multitasking <laughs> is, so. is traumatic. <laughs> it works better under Windows 8 or Windows 10. Mm -hmm. um, I got a really good, we were tweeting about that whole, like, one, you know, 1, 2, 4 gigabyte Chromebook yeah. device. Um, 
I, I got a really cool uh, tweet from at Hired Cam with a heads up on the great suspender, uh, which is a Chrome oh. extension from Suspension Labs, like suspend Chrome tabs to reduce the memory footprint of Chrome. It's pretty cool. It just sits up here in the corner uh, if I have the machine with it installed on it. You click on it and it allows you to sort of suspend the tab you're on or suspend all the other tabs or okay. resume all the tabs. My results were mixed. Um, I think I went from like 70% memory usage down to about 50% memory usage, but I also had 10 Chrome windows with about 225 tabs open. Oh wow. So, uh, you know, your mileage will probably be better if you don't keep the thousand tabs open all the time. <laughs> a lot of folks love this. This is an incredibly <laughs> popular, it's like four and a half stars with over 2,000 reviews wow. uh, in the Chrome extension store. Um, there's a great, great, great uh, article up on uh, TechSpot. Um, you know, I have 16 gigabytes of RAM on everything, but how much RAM, four gigabytes versus eight gigabytes versus 16 gigabyte performance? TechSpot did a great, great roundup, uh, and they tested like four versus eight versus 16 with gaming, oh, nice. with applications. Um, TechSpot has a really good reminder for everybody. Quote, once you have enough memory for all your applications to run, having more memory won't increase performance any further. Um, you know, so if you sort of like control shift escape and open your task manager and start looking in the details inside of here and start looking at performance, you know, if you're not using more memory than you have, you are good to go. You mm -hmm. don't need more memory. But when you take a look at this TechSpot article, um, they did some great testing for say gaming with tons of tabs in Chrome open, and they found there was almost no frame rate difference between four gigabytes, eight gigabytes, and 16 gigabytes. Wow. Well, that's because games are for the most part designed for the sort of minimal system configuration that most people have. So there's almost no frame rate difference between four gigabytes and eight gigabytes and 16 gigabytes, and frankly, even memory hungry apps like Adobe, uh, uh, creative Cloud. Creative like Cloud, Creative yeah. Cloud. I always forget that one. It's like, you know, Photoshop, <laughs> Adobe Premiere. Didn't actually get much of a boost going from eight to 16 gigabytes of RAM. Wow. Now, I know people that are working with like terabytes of video that will be like, mm, 64 gigabytes or die. But it turns out eight gigabytes for Windows and OS 10 is probably the perfect sweet spot for the vast majority of people out there. Yeah. So I will try to resist spending an extra $50 for 16 gigs of RAM on the next time I build a system. <laughs> But I doubt I will, because I... I am 16 gig. I am a 16 gigger for all my gaming needs, even yeah. though apparently I don't need it. You don't need it. <laughs> for games, I, there, I don't Although think Although I do do a lot of like video editing, so maybe. That's where you start needing it if you yeah. have lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of video and lots and lots and lots of elements. But for the yeah. vast majority of humanity, eight gigabytes, you're good to go well into the future. The remote that came with Ant's Nexus player died. <laughs> So sad. And he emailed ask at techthing.com. I really don't like using my phone to control it as I have to wake unlock my phone every time. I, I am that. having trouble finding a replacement though. I am so confused with all the options I have found. Side clicker, flirk, I'm gonna say flirk, <laughs> Fire Fork. TV remote, and the really expensive Harmony Hub. Oh yeah. Welcome it's not fun. to the nightmare of dead remotes for fairly obscure products. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> One of the advantages of Roku and Apple TV uh, is that they're good about keeping replacements available. You might find one on eBay for your Nexus player, uh, but pickings are going to be slim if there are any at all. And that's the problem, right? When you have something, it's like people, not a lot of people bought it, and there's no replacement parts, and then all of a sudden you find out people want more than you paid for it originally to get just part of it on eBay. <laughs> well, it just blows my mind how much these things will go for online. Yes. Do you like Harmony? I love Harmony's remote. So Logitech bought Harmony a long, long time ago. If you're not familiar uh, with Logitech's Harmony remotes, essentially um, they bring all of your things together into a single remote control. That is the reason they exist. Uh, it's easy to spend hundreds of dollars on these. Um, you know, unfortunately for the Nexus player, the inexpensive $50 Harmony 350 won't work uh, mm. because you need Bluetooth to control it. Um, so you need a Bluetooth uh, with a Harmony hub, and those are gonna start at about 130 bucks and top out at about 350 bucks. They're not cheap, but they control just about everything. They solve a lot of problems, like Ant wants to have one remote control, the Nexus player, and change inputs and control the volume on the TV, um, which is the whole point of something like Harmony's activity program, where you press like, you know, Blu-ray, yes. and it, you know, at turns on I your use, television. Mine is watch TV, and right. it turns on the TV, 
the Sony surround system thing that I have mm -hmm. and my Roku all at once, and it is amazing. You it can, saves me so much work. Yeah, I mean, you can use them to control your uh, your your Wi-Fi enabled light bulbs, right? Yeah, so that you when can. you hit the button, you know, the screen comes down, the AVR fires up, the light bulbs dim, like all of the things <laughs> work together, and that's really what you're paying for is the ability to control everything with a Harmony mm -hmm. uh, Harmony's remote system. I have read that some folks have gotten HDMI CEC, that's consumer electronics control uh, over oh. the HDMI port to work to control the Nexus player. Um, if you've never played around with HDMI CEC or turned it on your, HD, your HDTV, essentially, yeah. for example, if I plus the Apple remote, my AVR automatically switches to the Apple TV. Uh, you know, and, and then allows the video from that to go through. And if I turn around and press the Nexus remote, then it switches to the Nexus player, oh. then the Nexus. I don't have a Nexus. The Roku, then the it Roku switches player, to the Roku okay. player, right? So, uh, and cool. I have a single, you know, I can use the television remote control things. Um, so with the Nexus player, you basically get back home and arrows to, and select on your television remote. That might be the easiest and least expensive option. Um, I had not heard about side clicker. Side Clicker is really funny if you've never seen it. Um, started as a Kickstarter <laughs> project. It's a little IR remote uh, that attaches to the side of your Roku, your Apple TV, your Google Nexus player, your Fire TV. Uh, oh. And what it does is add TV remote controls like TV, power, volume, switching, and all that kind of stuff right there. Uh, and they have little different adapters that allow you to use the side click on different remote controls. So for example, I'm looking at the Roku and the Fire TV right now. Um, you know. The problem with that one is you still need your Nexus remote to control the Nexus. Yep. Um, <laughs> I, this has turned into kind of a survey of, of remote controls. Uh, the FLIRC uh, is a, uh, or the F-L-I-R-C, I, I call it FLIRC because Shannon calls I it I think FLIRC. FLIRC is great. I think FLIRC is great too. <laughs> um, what this essentially does, it's a universal remote receiver, plugs into a USB, uh, basically plugs into a USB port, pretends to be a keyboard. That sounds familiar. This is the... the Doesn't it? the episode of weird things being plugged into <laughs> USB ports. Um, it's pre-programmed for Fire TV control for Harmony remotes out of the box. Um, you'll need to program it to work with a Nexus player. Most folks use the Flirk with the Nexus player so that their Harmony remotes will control it. So now you're buying like a $15 or $25 Flirk on top of, that's $23 now, uh, on top of the Harmony remote, which you don't really need because the Harmony remote with the hub can actually control it. I've also heard that some simple stuff like the back button doesn't seem to have consistent behavior with all the apps on the Nexus player. Um, you know, Flirk's supposed to work with PlayStation, Xbox 360, uh, the Raspberry Pi, you have BMC, Kodi, and Plex. Wow. So I, I'm kind of tempted to get one of these to play around uh, with on Raspberry Pi media players. <laughs> so Ant, we wish you good luck and we feel your pain if you get stuck using your phone. But hey, at least that's an option. <laughs> well, you laugh, it right? It is an option. But if, you know, there's, <laughs> there's some devices with really weird remote controls and if you yeah. lose the remote control, um, you know, you, you become that person that's constantly searching on eBay. Yep. This is the week somebody's going to offer one for sale. Uh, and that can be immensely frustrating, so. Oh, man. Well, yes, good luck, Ant. And let us know what happens and what you find works best for you. We would love to share it on the show. There you have All right, it. I think that's about it. But remember, <laughs> just like we do every single week, once in a while, you got to put down your phone, step away from the screen, and close your laptop and do something analog, like Patrick's choice this week. Explore beach and find really tiny frogs. What? They're so cute. Oh, my goodness. They were like the size of a dime. There were dozens of them. They're so cute. And you put your hand down and they hopped onto your hand. Oh my God. Yes. Okay. Mm, I'm gonna freak out. I wanna go find this beach in Lake Play with all the little I'll tell you where they are. <laughs> I'm Battery Norton. I'm Shannon Morse. We'll see you next week on Tech Bay. <laughs>